you are all welcome to today's workshop session this is the the first workshop on this uh, program uh, we're going to kick off immediately so everybody others can be just joining in as they're coming along yeah mr gary is already here mr gary you're welcome okay let me unmute you sorry sorry about that rookie mistake yeah <laughs> yeah how are you sir i'm doing well today okay. looking forward to this oh awesome yeah everybody has really been i've been looking forward to this so uh we started uh, last uh okay just this week we started and uh you are also holding our first workshop and uh, we're happy to have you uh we we are everybody's expectant you can see them coming and we have about 20 startups that are are going through this uh, accelerator program so um right. i'll just hand over to you uh you will uh, uh introduce yourself yeah uh here i can do that yeah and then you go and, ahead uh, and now we have about an hour 90 minutes how much time do we have okay um let's say yeah an hour and 20 minutes is what we might have about an hour and 20 minutes okay all right i know i can time to that because we want to make it a workshop and try to accomplish a few things as well yes so i'll start with just a little bit of my background <clears throat> um so when i got out of the army i got hired pretty much the next day by a large defense contractor making combat vehicles so that's how I started my corporate career. I worked in that and and aerospace technology totally for about probably 25 years, 20, 25 years total. Um, I launched my business, GLJ Group, with the purpose of continuing to bring innovation to market. That was in 2004. Um then uh, in 2011, I launched South Valley Angels, which is uh, to fund startups, early stage startups. And then uh, we launched Scale Up Stream just a little over uh, about 18 months ago as a platform in which to be able to globally communicate and work for the purpose of developing innovation. Now, with that said, I've done I've built incubators in different parts of the world. Um, I've worked with, like, throughout Europe. I've worked with almost all the plug and plays, um, Draper Universities, the Y Combinators. Uh, I'm in the Silicon Valley, and I've I've been here for quite some time. So I sort of grew with the Silicon Valley. So that's my background. Let me share my screen. Okay. Sure, I can get in the right place here. All right. Yeah. Can everybody see that? Yes, yes, perfectly. Okay, I'm going to kind of get all the Zoom stuff out of the way. But if anyone has any questions, um, just let me know. Um, I, and they can also, I guess, uh, Paul, if you're going to look at the uh, the questions or chats, if you just let me know, because I, I yeah. I'm not looking at that. Yeah. Um, and then we can ask these in real time. Let me know if I'm talking too fast. Okay. I do talk fast. <laughs> Even for people that speak English. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to start from what I consider the very beginning of the journey. And that is crafting your vision. Um, I never really understood the value of a vision when I was in corporate because all visions had a vision, but that was somebody else. I, I was just there because I had a job. Mm -hmm. But in the startup world and being a CEO, your vision is critical. It's what everything you're doing should be built on, not solving a problem. And I think that's a big uh, area where there, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. Yeah. The problems change every day. Okay. But your vision should be consistent and it should de develop 
a critical path of what you're doing. So today we're going to focus on vision and we're going to go through a bunch of you that want to participate and we'll try to craft your vision, a vision statement to start from and get some experience on how to think about it. Then we're going to look a little bit at how to see the opportunity because with your vision, you see a pathway to an opportunity. So we're going to talk a little bit about opportunity, although a detailed discussion will go beyond this class. Yeah. But without a vision and tying it to an opportunity, then uh, there's, there's nothing really there yet. So we'll, we'll, we can talk a little bit about that. Okay, so let's get started on that. So assuming that all of you here are the CEO or founder of your business, let's talk about a CEO. What is a CEO's job? Who wants to try to answer that or give their thoughts on how they believe it is? No takers? Okay, there's someone. Um, let me um, can go. yeah, Victor Gibrin. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Um, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Victor Gibrin, I'm CEO of Asadanoga. Um, okay, so in, in my own perspective, um, the job of a CEO is to craft a vision, um, communicate it um, effectively, and build a team around it to achieve that vision. That's pretty well done. That's pretty well done. That's uh, almost sounds like you, I, you and I have talked before. <laughs> There's one more person raising their hands. And uh, but yeah, that basically okay. the number one thing is bringing that vision and direction to the table, and mm -hmm. that's critical. Where is the company going? Where you know the purpose and the vision are kind of similar. Um, but from a vision, it's it's being able to see that pathway and see what's at the end of that and understanding what's kind of going on at that point in time. So as a startup today, we all want to talk about our product because that's the baby. I mean, that's, that's what we all want to talk about. We've got this product. It solves a problem. Let's talk about the product. Um, but... But the product and the needs and so forth can change throughout time. Your vision should be should stay on track. That doesn't mean a way it shift a little bit. The second job is raising money. CEOs are always raising money, either from investors, friends and family, banks, shareholders. It changes throughout. But those are the two jobs of a CEO. So actually, the job's pretty simple. Raise money and keep everybody on track to where where you believe everything should be headed. Now, a third part of that, no less important, is try to develop a culture. Um, cultures are difficult to build, but on the other hand, they're also simple to build. Culture gets built by the leadership. The people that are working with you in your organization will do what you do. If, if you play the game right, work hard, They'll play the game right. They'll work hard. You'll build a good culture. So you can write all the books you want on culture, but you have to do it. You have to lead by example. So those are really what I see as the three main jobs of the CEO. If you can do all those clearly, you'll be able to build a strong team around. Any thoughts on that? Okay. So that's the beginning of things. So this is what we're talking about here. This roadway, having a clear understanding and communicating of what that is. Because as a startup today, remember, we're on day one. We haven't built a product. We haven't done any much analysis or anything yet. We're just getting started. So we have to understand what this looks like. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates of the world, they didn't get funded because they had an MVP. They got funded because they had a clear understanding of where they were today and what the future was going to look like and the kind of things and what was going on in that future and the kind of products that might be necessary. From there, they identified a plan to go after them. And that's what we're talking about now. So think of it kind of like this. This road, I think of this road as a river. 
and your product is a canoe. We can always build a better canoe, but if we put the canoe in the wrong river, it won't take us where we want to go. And so getting in the right river is critical. That's the important part. And that's where the vision comes in. Okay. Now, one of the problems I believe with the current model, and I'll, it, it's a balance of this, is everything today starts from building a product and solving a problem. And there's a natural connection to the vision, the opportunity, and solving problems. They're all three connected. Solving the problem is really about capturing the opportunity that you see within the vision. And with that, let's talk a little bit about invention and innovation. <clears throat> A lot of entrepreneurs believe that they have to be inventing something. Uh, the last thing invented in the Silicon Valley was probably the microchip by Intel. There are problems that are necessary to be solved. A lot of times these are big problems. They're solved by science. They're deep tech. They're expensive. There's entire specific funding for deep tech kind of startups. In most cases, most startups are actually bringing to table an idea. They're bringing in a better, faster, cheaper way to do something. Maybe not cheaper, but definitely better and faster. There may be something that feels like invention involved within it, but that's not necessarily the case. So today, almost everything that's coming to the table can be done already, but it doesn't get done with AI. It doesn't get done with robotics. It won't be getting done with integrated systems. There's a lot coming over the next few years, very much to what was happening in the late 80s when the computer was coming out. The computer was coming out as a device that was going to be in every office on every desk. It hadn't got there yet, but it was coming. And the problem of building the technology and computers and all that was being accomplished by big companies and so forth and so on. But in, after that happened, the Dell came out, Gateways and all these other companies with just a better idea. Well, I could build what you already spent all that time to figure out, but I, I can now do it for $750, not $2,500. So they had better ideas, better products. So if we think about it in that, that manner, there's a lot, a little bit about that. But first, how, how many of you out there, uh, you, we just show with a raise, a show of hands or whatever. Let me pop up my uh, participants. How many of you have a product built already? Not necessarily an MVP launch, but just something built that's kind of getting close to being launched or has been. You know, to raise their hands on that or. Okay, looks like we've got a few people, a couple people. Oh, here we go. There's more hands coming up. So then, is it correct to assume that the rest of you haven't started building a product yet? Okay. So in the perfect world, that's the way to do it. But 99% of the companies we work with have already built a product. So they didn't really build a vision and understand that the way we're going to talk about it today. They, most people already know what they want to build because you have a background, you've got an expertise, you've got a work history, you've got a career of some sort doing something that gives you the knowledge that you've done to say, hey, there's a problem out there, I need to fix it. Now, the problem with starting this way is you get what we call investor bias and you inherently are looking at today's problem. And trying to build a solution means you're building today's solution. So what happens a lot of times is we sit down and we jump up and we say, hey, I've got a good. Now, as, in, as a CEO, it's important to ensure. Oh, sorry about that. 
to ensure that everything doesn't look like a nail to you. You have to be able to keep a clarity of mind as you're building your product because you spend so much time with it, it can eventually engulf you. And so that's where the vision comes in and that's where the vision is important. If you start by building a product before you build your business case, which is what comes out of your vision and the opportunity, then it's sort of like, you know, building a key before you built the door. And that's why 42% of startups fail. It's because of timing. Why now? The timing was not right for a variety of reasons for the various players that were necessary to have that happen. So today, any questions on that a little bit? I wanted to go through some kind of global things a little bit before we get into having some fun here. You know, I've seen that Peter has his hands raised. Peter, do you have a question? No, no. I, I raised my hand from the other question. From okay. The okay. You yeah, he was saying that. Yeah, he had. A, he had. A, he's got a product. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Sir. Sure. No problem. Yeah. So now today we're going to focus on two parts: the vision and the opportunity. There's some additional parts we're going to talk about just a little, but not really spend much time on them. And that is. The whole idea of the vision is to drive the, how you see an opportunity so you can understand how you can solve, how you can capture that opportunity and determine how you fit within the sandbox. Once you understand all this, the direction, have a baseline, what you think. Now, you'll go through the details of building that out, building your organization and the actual detailed plan. But that vision will keep you focused. So let's start from the very beginning. The vision. Per the Dalai Lama, need to have a vision. So who, we're going to start with a little exercise here, and hopefully we can do it with several, as many as we can. Who has a vision statement they want to share? Okay, so. Uh, now, this is the, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so this week, uh, every, part of the, uh, my stone for this week was um, everybody submitting their business vision statement and mission statement. Yeah, I think uh, about five or there about persons have submitted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe I'll just call on uh, some of them. To... Yeah, if there's somebody that has called one of the people. Let's see. Yeah. Um, God and let's play with it. Emmanuel, smash she. Okay. Hello, sir. Yeah, can you do you have your visual statement handy? Yes, my visual statement. I can speak on them on it, so, sir. Okay, so but just I'm not able to share my screen. You want to share your screen? I think you. I should. won't be able to share my screen. Okay, okay, okay. All right. that's okay. We can just go. Yeah, you I... can just say it. Okay, my vision statement reads to be Africa's smartest gateway for all supply chain financing and social impact. Okay. To be Africa's smartest gateway for all business chain financing and social impact. Financing and social impact. Okay. Then the okay. mission. So let's start with okay. that. So... When you're talking about a vision, you're you're talking about the future. You're seeing that, that that light at the end of that road. So what I see here is a nice goal to be Africa's gateway to business and financial impact. Uh, that's a nice goal, nice objective, um, nice purpose, you know, so to speak. Maybe not quite a purpose, but what is the actual? What is the actual vision? So let's think about this for a little bit here. Think about like this. We believe the future of business, whatever, and social and financial impact will be, or we see a world where 
business and social impact are one and the same or driven by or so forth and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay, so let's try that again. Think about that. Using one of those sentence structures, think about how you would, how would you lay it out now? So let's try that again. So how about something like the future of Africa's, let's see what we had, gateway, let's see, in a in business process. So Tell me a little bit about what you're doing. Ultimately, what 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 are you doing? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through this exercise here for a little bit. Here are some examples of some general vision statements. The future of automobile will be electric. AI will replace humans in business analytics and process work. And so think of it kind of in this kind of a flow with your gateway and how that works is we want to get to a point where we understand where you're going what you're doing in a clear manner in, in one simple easy state okay and this says if look, let me take from the first one the first one says the future of the automobile will be electric oh. mm -hmm. Okay, the future Elon Musk. That's that was his vision statement. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I would say may not be future, everybody's, but it was his. Okay, what I say? Okay, I think I will do this. The future of SME microcredit financing will be supply chain impact or supply. Let me see. I'm trying to get supply chain with another word. The future of SAB micro credits will be supply chain financing. Supply chain financing. Okay. Would it be possible if it was the other way around that the the future of supply chain financing will be micro credits? SME micro credit financing. Would would it work better that way? So your your your, your business is looking at using the microcredit financing to fund supply chain. Is that what you're talking about doing? Absolutely, sir. Okay. So I would say then to change that around a little bit, you'd say the future of supply chain financing will be SME micro credit. Micro credit. There you go. Is there something else though? Microcredit and what? Anything else? Is there a follow on to that? Uh, yeah, I think microcredit financing and social impact. And social impact. Okay, there you go. Very good. So, okay, now that's a vision statement. We can improve mm -hmm. upon that, but now you're, I understand where you're going. You believe the supply chain is going to be done by this. Okay, fair enough. Good enough. So, that's a better vision statement. Doesn't mean it's perfect yet. Oh. <laughs> but that's a better statement. It tells me what you're thinking. Now, keep in Absolutely. mind, as the CEO, it's critical that you, this is what you bring to the table. And it's important that everything you're doing should be based on how you see the future and where it's going. Not the problems you're solving. The problems you're solving will change day to day, week to week, month to month. Right now, everybody for the next five years is going to solve the same fundamental problem. And that is the transition to an AI-driven digital economy and social uh, experience. That's the big problem that everybody's going to be solving. They're all going to be, everybody's going to be writing AI stuff. Anyway, if, so, so that's a good one. So who wants to give me, who, give me another person with a, Vision state. Okay, let's take uh, UGRL. Uh, Chukudi, can you? I think he has a good one too. Yeah. Yes, good day. And good afternoon, Mr. Gray. Well, the UGR, our premise is really local advertisements. So we believe the future of uh, West African ads will be 
extremely local advertisements. Okay. I like that. That's simple. It's great to the point. It's kind of sort of along the long line, the idea of the agriculture one, where the future of agriculture will be to grow a local and consume a local, not ship it everywhere. Mm. So you're looking at the same thing. So you're looking at very localized and personalized advertising. Yes, sir. Okay, I like that. Is there any follow-on that goes with that? Is it local advertising? Okay, is there a follow-on that, that, that then like ties you to something, or is there anything, or just local advertising as a period? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, we believe we want to start advertising, build a good name, and we want to uh, move into the micro uh, transactions field, like processing all these uh, event tickets and bus tickets, like being a middleman, getting these smalls. Small, small commissions. Okay. So you want to apply the micro payments to through a local advertising model? Yes, sir. All these guys that they met, that promote their, I guess, conferences. The, the religious uh, scene is pretty big here. So all these guys promoting their conferences, these musicians, uh, you sure. already got these sure. guys, going to all these guys. So, yeah. Okay. I, I, it, we're, I think right now, just at the vision, that's a good vision. It's got a very specific thing that you're going to do. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the next step now. So that one's, that one's not too bad. Not too bad. Okay, who else has one? Yeah, let me... Uh, Peter. Peter Ademi, could you unmute? Yes, thank you. Right. Um, so I'm Peter, CEO of Cubes. At Cubes, we are pro, um, providing... African tertiary students with a tool um, that they use to make their academics easier, um, improving their learning outcomes and their learning experiences. Um, but globally, our vision is very simple, to make life and work better. So everything we'll be developing will be around how people can be more productive in their life and in their work, to make life and work better. Okay, okay. Yeah. So to me, that is, sounds a little more like a mission statement to make life and work better. Okay. It's not really visionary. It's not giving him any direction. So where do you think that's headed? Um, so you're building an app, so you've got a sense of what you're doing, but making life and work better, How there's, there's a lot of ways to cut that pot. Right. What's your piece of that? How do you vision that, that piece from your viewpoint? Right. Um, so for us, the, the future we envisage is a future where everyone has access to tools that makes them more productive and makes them, you know, makes their life easier, just a little bit better okay, than, tools, than it was. Tools. Before. What do you mean yes. by tools? Hand tools, digital tools, any kind digital of tools? tools definitely. Digital tools, definitely. Digital tools? Yes. Okay. All right. There we go. You're talking about digital tools as far as tools to build software, to build things to or tools to accomplish like... To go ahead. To enhance work, basically. To enhance work, study, life, or just be more productive generally. Okay. So to right now undefined but to have that this goal in mind okay so then what you have here i would i would look at your mission statement as being an end goal and end objective of mission is to make like and work life and work better that's the end goal possible but a vision statement from what i was hearing there would be something more along the lines that we believe the future of work-life balance will be, so we're talking about, um, will be, you know, something like seamlessly, you know, where the tools are in there somehow, but will be seamlessly and, you know, add value, something, just sort of throw a number of things out there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. 
Because when I was listening to you a little bit, I got more of a bigger sense that it's not about creating another Microsoft Excel, another Microsoft Word, another Microsoft PowerPoint, or all these various tools that we all use to make our life better, and if, whether that's a work life or personal life, but more like a more of a communication integration capability to balance that out, out in seamlessly and in, in some sort of a personalized interface. Is that a true statement? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so I'm assuming it's an app, but anyway, but to go to the bigger picture. Okay, so I would tie your future statement in then. So tell me from that perspective, then we believe the future of work-life balance will be what? How do you see it? Or we see a world where work-life balance is managed through, or how would you finish that? We see a world where work-life balance is becomes more seamless how is that i like that seamless is a good word i threw that in one of mine up there is seamless okay i like that yeah. now it definitely screams like it should be seamless and something else yeah I, I i was thinking i was thinking uh bringing in the digital tools uh is there a way to bring in the digital tools aspect of it as well so <laughs> how about we could say did you know seamless and digital that could be a possibility Right. So hold that thought for a little bit. Now let's take these as examples and, and go kind of the next step. And okay. so we'll, we can play with this when we get done with, as we have time left over, we can continue to do different vision statements for if everybody wants to try to do it, we'll try to do that. Yeah. Um, because now we're getting into vision statements and keep in mind that these are not just words on a, on a piece of paper. You need to pick the right words, the perfect words, because you need to own these words. If somebody says, why are you doing this? Your answer is because we believe the future of is going to be this. And you believe it. That's your score. Why you're doing what you're doing. Is that a fair enough statement? So this is why we're, we're the vision is critical. Now, 99% of startups don't have a vision statement. So it's not uncommon if I ask the question in a room full of startups, I won't get an answer. And if I do, they will generally be more of a mission statement or more of a goal that they want to achieve, not necessarily a clarity of vision of how to remember. We're trying to, where's my road at here? Where'd my road go? Mm -hmm. We're trying to look out here through this road you know, and, and see where it's going and pick the right things. So now what we want to do is we're going to talk about the opportunity a little bit. So as a vision, we talked about up here that for a vision to have impact, and it's got to, it's got to be an opportunity there. So if, with your vision, based on what you're looking at in the idea of work-life balance, getting back to the various aspects, of making use and applications of micropayments and so forth. We want to look at the opportunity. And the opportunity is a combination of a vision and a plan. And today we're not going to talk too much about the plan, but we are going to talk about it. So we understand the vision. We see a vision. We can see a clarity of where things are going. Now, Market size, Tam, Sam, Sam. Are you all familiar, are you familiar with that? Those comments or those words? Target market, available market, obtainable market. Yes, are those familiar? Yeah, I am. Okay. Anyway, you'll learn more about those. So they're nice numbers, but at the end of the day, they're just numbers. They're top down. Tam is important because it defines the sandbox that you're playing in, as I like to call it. What's the sandbox you're in? And it's important to understand what's going on in your sandbox. Not that you're going to capture all that sandbox or even most of that sandbox, but you're in that sandbox doing stuff. So let's look at an opportunity in three levels. You have a vision. And so because of that, you're seeing a specific market you believe is going to be a good market to go into because million or people are going to need to do this. So let's use the electric car since that's a simple one. We believe the future of the automobile will be electric cars. 
Therefore, that puts us in the electric vehicle market, which is a market that's growing. And here's all these stats. You can Google it and see that the electric vehicle market is growing. Maybe not as fast as everybody would like it to, but it's growing. And it's big. Next, what is going on in that market that supports your vision? And again, your vision is all about seeing the future in a direction. So what trends are happening? What direction are Sorry, they drive you questions you need to answer as you're going through these thoughts. So what you're doing now is I defining why do you believe that the electric vehicle market is going to be good? What trends are there? And then finally, what are your market segments or the customers? And I don't mean a detailed customer persona yet at this point. Just what are the main market segments you're going to focus on? And in the earlier, we had the idea of micro um you know uh, finance and so forth working in two different market applications okay so now what are those going to be so now let's think about that in a little more a little more clarity using the vehicle market we you know we're this is going to put us in the trillion dollar electric vehicle market and there's stats that show that don't think of this as a pitch or anything this is a way of thinking as a ceo this is your ultimate story because as a CEO, you should never be selling your product. Now, as a startup CEO, you may be the only one in there, so somebody has to sell the product. But as a CEO, you should always be selling the vision and why you're doing it. The product is a result of that. And it's just a product that you probably haven't built yet, so we don't even know if it's a good product yet. So, but, but products are fixing. So you're in this market and there are trends. This is the most important piece of your vision and understanding how to see it and create your business case. Almost all markets, particularly in Africa, particularly digital and payments and financing and so forth, they're going to be growing markets. But what are the real trends that are happening? Where are things at already? Where are they going? The ability to have changing dynamics you know, demographics. So for example, one of the things I'm seeing as an investor talking to lots and lots of companies and being here in the Silicon Valley is we get companies come to us, oh yeah, we're an AI company, we're, we're, we're developing AI. Okay, what are you doing? Well, we're gonna allow people to simply communicate to their computer and go through this, so forth and so on, answer these questions, whatever the case may be, and we will give them exactly what they're looking for. And what's they're looking for may be a very complex and an amazing and a very interesting application. But the use of their AI is going to be on every, it, you know, it's already on every Windows 11 computer built. I can, I've got uh, Microsoft Autopilot on my computer. Uh, it's, I've got it on my phone already. So the ability to just communicate to your computer is not going to be, that's, that's not a visionary comment. That would have been visionary three years ago, but to, today the products are going to be built that if, if it's, if it's applicable to what you're doing, then that will be an expected feature that'll just be there. And there'll be plugins. You just plug in what it is. Microsoft just released like 11 AI suites that you can use and use and plug in, create your own AI, use it for sales, use it for GitHub, whatever the case may be. But anyway, so, that's one of the problems I'm seeing with a lot of companies that are coming out now is they think that having the ability to communicate with their computer via voice is the technology they're bringing to the tape. If that makes sense. So as you're doing your vision, keep these things in mind and understand where the opportunity is really going. Yes, the demographics say everybody wants to do that. And there's technology now that's saying, well, everybody can. Pretty soon, it'll be on every Google phone. Um, it's like you, you, know, you can only get it on the phone now to replace your assistant, and it'll be on every PC. You know, Macs are still coming along that world, but the Apple world. But once they move down that way, it'll just be the standard. So that's not the sell. Okay. So it's critical to understand these dynamics. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on that? There's a lot there. That's a pretty. There's a lot in that little topic. Yeah, I'm seeing a hand raised. Uh, Chukwu, did you have a question? Your hand is raised.
Okay. I don't think. No. Okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead. So now the final piece of this is the market segments and what market segments you're going in. And you need to be able to go from your vision down to your market segments in a logical, compelling manner. So let's just use the electric car as an example. We believe the future of the automobile will be electric. Therefore, we're looking and we see an opportunity in the $1 trillion electric vehicle market, which is expected to grow by massive amounts because of all these reasons and regulations and everybody's got to have one and so forth and so on. And so the reason to do that is absolutely right now. We see two market segments we believe that we should enter. One is batteries, and the other was charging stations because everybody has to have them. So you want to be able to have this logical approach of how you get from your vision to where you believe you're headed. We haven't even thought we, we're just getting to a product or a market segment, it's not necessarily a specific product we have been building yet. We're looking at them as being batteries and charging stations. And those are market segments, but it may turn out. We may just build an app that allows you to communicate with all of the diff different charging stations out there or some other things that goes along with that. So do e either one of you that did a, that worked on your uh, vision statement want to try to walk through from a vision statement to your market segment? That's a little difficult. That's a, that may be a challenge, but if you want to give it a try, we'll see where it goes. No? Okay. That takes a lot of work. But if you can do this... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there's uh, someone. Uh, okay. Chigose has his hand. Chigose, can you... Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Nothing? No, it's coming. It's coming. Oh, coming. Okay. I think I keep... Okay. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Okay, so I said I didn't do the first time, but can I go ahead just to... Sure, go ahead. Okay, so from the vision, um, we believe that the future of retail is organized, automated, and digital. Um, we are seeing um, a high growth of population in Africa, over 1.2 billion people, with over 70% of them as young people, with high adoption of technology here in Africa. Um, and also, um, there is also a growth rate of um, over um, $200 million uh, is being spent year on year on groceries and items that are bought from local stores and offline retail stores. Um, the markets that we're looking at is really the infrastructure that will enable retail stores to operate their businesses offline. Um, and then the other side is really um, synchronizing their offline sales with um um, online shopping or digital shopping. Okay. Okay, so that gets us down through where you're at. You've got a vision. You've talked about where some of the opportunity is. What markets are you, what, what would your market segments one and two be, let's say? Okay, um, the market segments are um, Offline stores or, or supermarkets or retail stores, um, and the well, they're different. They're that... slight. They're different, but you, yeah. So supermarkets is pretty distinct. So we have, of... yeah, we have supermarkets, um, and then other pop and mom shops. Retail, but mainly mom and pop shops. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So not too bad. Not too bad. Um. You know, you want to be able to, to understand this because this is really the future and why you're doing everything. Does that make sense? You know where yes, you're sir. at, where you're going, and what you're trying to do. You're going after these market segments to do these specific things. Yes, I do. Okay. So now from there, let's talk about a couple things, and then maybe we can uh, – we still have plenty of time to go, so we're in good shape here still. Uh, but I want to talk about a couple things because it's important to tie these together so that the vision and the beginning of your business case is what we're trying to get to today is to understand a clarity on that. So now we have a vision. We believe the future of is going to be, and we see an amazing opportunity in front of us, and we believe we understand the market segments we want to approach. 
Now, one thing on market segments real quick also is understanding with a startup, it's about speed to market. So you want to get into a market segment you can get into quickly and rapid. Not necessarily the biggest one, but the one that you can learn from the fastest. So that generally tends to be who somebody knows on your team that you can go and get meetings set up or get customers or start getting people to start doing what you're trying to do. Um, a lot of times people get focused on being around John and getting in the biggest market, but that may take a year to get even a meeting set up in there because nobody on your team knows anyone or knows how to do it. So think about that as you're thinking markets to get into. The big market is good, but as you start breaking these markets down into very specific applications, think about that as well. So, okay, now with that, oh, we're going to talk about that into the next section of the, and that is the competitive landscape. Uh, so let's have a little fun with this one. So how many of you have a competitive landscape chart or have put together something or thought about your competitive? How many of you have like an Excel spreadsheet that says, here's the features that are important, here's what we have, and you have yeses or Xs? Do some of you have that kind of a chart? Yeah, just show of hands, anybody. Just show of hands if you have. Okay, all right. Got a couple people have those, okay. okay. So that's an important chart, but not yet. That's a good chart for the second meeting with the investors or the chart when you're building the actual product for customer use. That's when things like features become important. So right now, we're still contemplating what would even be building. So we have a vision. We see an opportunity. Where does that fit in the competitive landscape? What direction are things going? How are they happening? And so what we mean by that is, again, think of things linear. So your vision defines how you see the future market. Remember, we had that road, light at the end of the tunnel. So what we're thinking now is your business positioning and insight, not a product comparison. There's no reason to compare a product today if you haven't built it yet. And nobody's used it enough to know whether it's a good product. So that discussion is a difficult discussion to win, selling your future product against somebody else's future product. <laughs> but it is easier to talk about competition in the same manner of your vision and where are things going. So think of three competitors. We're going to call them the incumbent. That is the company or the technologies that have been doing this forever. Whether that's putting a flyer on a windshield or whether that's just using your flip phones or whatever, the incumbents are either the companies that everybody knows their name. They've been around for 20, 30 years, whatever the case may be. And this is how you've been able to do what you're doing forever. Not the way you're doing it in the future, but they're the ones that have been around forever. So, for example, in, in social media today, you could consider Facebook as an incumbent in social media. You know, those kind of things. So think about that. Companies have been doing it. Now, in many cases, there's so many companies that have been doing it for so long, it's not even companies anymore. It's just technologies or approaches. Next, you have the new kids on the block. And these are the companies that have come out in the last three to seven, eight, nine years that are starting to do what the incumbents have been doing but now, in most cases, they've probably moved it online, made it a SaaS model, made it a website, made it digital in some manner. So you could say using social media as an example, the new kids on the block could be everything as new as TikTok, let's call it, or, or as old as Snapchat. That range of people would be kind of the new kids on the block that have established new standards. People know who they are. They're growing. They've been around and popular for, you know, like say two, three, five, six, seven years, but they haven't been the around for 10, 20, 25 years, stuff like that. Okay, that's the new kids on the block. Then 
you have the next generation companies, which are the ones like you, were at, and they're actually the ones you're competing against. Because all of you are going to walk out with what you think is the right product at the right price in two years from now. Maybe three, give or take. And when you all walk out, now you're going to be looking and seeing what everybody walked out of that door with. And it won't be the products you're thinking about today. So let's look at our, let's look at it kind of from that perspective. And think about what we were doing earlier. Like, let's see here. Um, for example, supply chain for, for you know, for um, social impact, right? So yeah. you could put, just say like supply chain, social impact, or whatever could be the categories of your on here. For an example, for today, we're just going to say faster and smarter. But that could be for the logistics. That could be where you put your your, your social impact and so forth. Um, same thing on the advertising. You know, being local. You know, microtransaction kind of deal. But this is where your your vision now comes to rest. We have a future. We see the future. And the future is going to drive what we think you're doing. So those of you that aren't real familiar with these charts, these are, this is, you're going to be up in this corner because everything to the right and up is better than to the right and down or some like, nobody wants to be down. Everybody wants to be up. So we're going to put you up in this corner. And because this is what you believe, you are the epitome of the future, which you believe is me faster, smarter. So that means this is 100% the way you define faster. And this is zero. This is just zero, 100%. Sliding scale. Slower is whatever it is. Faster is what you define faster. Smarter is also zero to 100. So for anybody to be on this side of this line, they got to be at least 50% the way you define smarter. And they have to be at least 50% the way you define faster. So by default, almost, incumbents will almost always be 180 degrees at the end here. Because they're the ones that have been doing it forever. They're old. They're slow. You know, it's just, it's, it's the way your parents went shopping. Or it's the way your parents did stuff. It's, you know, they still exist and still a lot of people use them, but they're the old folks. Okay. Then next, the new kids on the block, which you probably do know their brand names, the sales forces of the world, you know, the Snapchats, the TikToks, whoever's in your space, they will pop out. And they won't be as slow, but they may not be headed in the same direction. They may be diverting. Some may be headed one way or another, but where you believe it is. Now, you may not know any next generation companies because unless you hang out in some place with a lot of next generation startups, you're probably not going to meet it. Now, here in the Silicon Valley, if I go out enough, I, I, I will run across enough startups that eventually you'll run into duplicates of doing what people are doing. But you may not. So if you don't, you just don't. But maybe you do. And the one that you do know is headed towards smarter, but they're not worried about faster. Maybe that's because they're in healthcare and speed isn't as important as not having anybody die on the operating table. So they need to be smarter more over fast. Maybe there's a reason for it. But you believe that if you're not headed in faster, smarter, then you're just wrong. This is where the market's been forever. This is where it's been the last few years. This is where people are taking. And we believe if you're not headed this way, you're just wrong. So now I have a vision. You see a vision. You understand the opportunity in that. You can see where you fit within the, the sandbox that you're doing in the direction you believe it's going. The reality is from an investor's perspective, if you accomplish those th things that I believe you have a clear vision, you understand what the opportunity looks, you know what the sandbox is around you, you've already probably won 60% of the argument. Because th those are things that if we're on the same path and putting everything in the same river, we know where this river is going to go. And we're in this river. So we know we're headed the right way. So that's the critical piece. Now, what th that leads to at this point now you know where everything's going. You know what the opportunity is. You understand the market segments. You've done some analysis on what the world's really looking for. 
Now you can start thinking about the problem and the solution. Not necessarily what you're going to build, but what a solution needs to look like. Most of the time, you're going to want to look at the tactical problems. This one right here. It's too slow. This is too crowded. This isn't that. Um, it's a fragmented, these kind of things. The reality is, whatever the tactical problems are today, you just need to be 10 times better than whatever they are. And if you solve the strategic problem of capturing the opportunity, then you've probably inherently just over overcome these. In many cases, the AI of the future will just naturally overcome these tactical problems today. So you want to look at your problems strategic. How do I capture the opportunity? So let's use our example of the electric car. We said we had two customers. We had or two market segments. One was batteries, and one was charging stations. So strategically, to capture the battery opportunity, today I just have to build a better battery. Nobody wants a cheaper battery. Nobody wants a smaller battery. Everybody wants a battery that'll go a 1,000 miles on a charge. And then, then I can start figuring out how to make it charge faster, how to make it smaller, how to make it lighter, how to make it less expensive, and those kind of things. But for me to be successful, I have to solve, I have to be able to capture this opportunity with a better battery. If I do that, I'll solve all the problems down here because I have a better battery. Now, in the world of charging stations, I do not necessarily have to build a better charging station if I can put it on every corner and in every garage. So I have two different ways of solving the problem from a strategic level. And these problems today, we're just going to solve it by putting it in every garage and making batteries that work better. What I really, what can get us in trouble are these future problems, adoption and emerging tech. So as you're looking at your vision and seeing the future and how the opportunity looks, make sure that what's coming down the road so you're not those people that are kicking off a startup today that think their AI contribution is going to be chat GPT or um, Microsoft co-pilot where I'm just oh we can talk to the I can talk and get answers that's that's not going to be the solution much like the SaaS model world just connecting people is not the answer anymore you can't just connect they have to connect there has to be a, a, a smartness and a seamlessness that makes that allow that to happen in the future and it has to result in some sort of an action so I, I you know just connecting and say hey we connected that's nice you know LinkedIn <laughs> Hey, let's connect. I connected. Hey, thanks for connecting. Okay, bye. You know, that's that's just connecting. That was 1.0. 2.0, that connection has to happen that comes back and says, hey, I see you guys are connected to this group. of talked to these people. You know, these are some common activities that are going, you guys could take advantage of these discussions that are happening right now and make action out of that. Now you've got something that's happening to connect. Anyway, those are the emerging things you've got to look at. As far as your product goes, your baseline, you just need to, what is it? What does it do? How does it do it? Why is it important? We're not going to go into a lot of detail of that today, but that in itself is not an easy task. If I was to ask most of you to tell, to tell me what it is, what it does, how it does it, why is it important, that in itself would be a 30-minute discussion. Can anybody in here want to try to tell me what their product is in one sentence? Just quickly, if I was to ask somebody, what is it? We can go, let's walk through this exercise once because this can actually be uh, entertaining as well as uh, informative. So who wants to try to answer these four questions? One sentence that grandma can answer after dinner. She'll understand it if you tell her what it is. So who wants to try these four? Okay. Uh, a good exercise. Yeah, okay. I see. Okay, let me choose someone who has already said. Let me, uh, Emmanuel... Emmanuel. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, good evening. All right, um, Emmanuel. What is it? Tell me what your product is. What is it? Uh, just Deal. Um, here for just, just Deal is a marketplace for buying and selling. So, second is brand new second item. It's just a marketplace connecting buyers and sellers. Okay, marketplace for connecting buyers and sellers. Okay. 
You could maybe expand that if it had a focus, but we'll go with that. So since we just know that, so now this question is important. Sometimes this question and the first one don't, you don't need the second one, depending how you answer the first one. In this case, I do. What does it do? Just the help to create trust between sellers and buyer in a way of making sure that you How about if we just say it creates trust in e-commerce? Mm. Yeah. Give me an example yes. today. Okay, so it creates trust. Okay, very good. You're a marketplace that creates trust. So far, so good. How does it do it? How does it create trust? It has just deal has an escrow services that holds money when a buyer pays for an item when he, re he or she received it before we credit the seller. Okay. How could you simplify that? Basically, you're validating it prior to crediting the seller, right? Yeah, it's... It just like an escrow service. Until the business is completed and both people are satisfied before we release the money to the seller okay okay very good okay so you have i'll just call it co-satisfaction yep prior to transaction yes so okay so of course that then has a tactical problem with it was how can you do that fast so it's not a burden on the system anyway that's the question okay so, okay, I know what it does. I know how it does it, kind of. We'll call that good enough right now. We're not going to go into the details of what that co-satisfaction process is, but there's one. So why is that important? It's it's important because uh, in Nigeria, we'll find out that there is this problem between, in all uh, markets places that we have in the country, Nobody, no e com no marketplace entirely has this process of managing their order, their processing, their orders on the platform. We have but because they don't have it, does it make it important? Does it make sense? That's the wrong angle. Just because somebody doesn't have something doesn't mean that there's a need for it. Um, you say so you don't, you don't want to look at well, they just they, they, you don't why is it about having a you know a process okay, okay let me come for safe trans okay let me come just the helps just it can easily help uh buyer the seller sell to anybody any buyer depending on the art so it's a brand new article item you can easily assess sell to anybody because it has an embedded system that can help you. Okay, Mr. Gary, can I, can I? Okay, I'm gonna, I got, no, no, I'm writing notes. Don't jump here. I got you, go right here. So here's what I'm seeing here. So the product is a, uh, you know, the real reason is because it's the most effective way to, really, it's the most effective way to, to create costs. Yes. It's so that's fine and bad. So I'm going to give you a good job. You did pretty good on that job. I'm going to run through real quick with something simple like a bicycle. I want since we're doing electric cars, we're going to talk about the real product, which is a bicycle. It's a bicycle. Everybody knows what a bicycle is. They can send around. What does it do? You know, carries you from point A to point B. How does it do it? It does it with human power. Why is it important? Because it will always be the most efficient form of transportation. Oh, period. Look, that is nice. So now you can lay it out like that. You know, it's a marketplace. You know, it. what does it do? It builds trust during e-commerce transaction. Oh, how does it do it? It has a co-method for ensuring co you know, status the transaction prior to a sale happening. Why is this important? For the user, it gives them confidence to, to pull the trigger and spend that money. For the seller, it feels the confidence 
weapons that are arriving to them. But in the other process, it may also ensure that there's less products returned. So there's a variety of reasons why this is. So that's why it may, in fact, be the most effective way to for e-commerce to grow out and so forth. Does that make sense? Perfectly. So, okay, so that's how you want to think about this exercise. So now this kind of brings us really getting close to the end of the journey of your business case. You see a future where it's, this is what it looks like. This is what the opportunity looks like because of that. And this is where we're going to go with that. This now is what the competitive landscape looks like from where they're going, where they're going, and where the market's. It's all about where the market's going, not what you want to build. You've got to build what's where the market's going. So with this process now, you do that, and here, here you can come and say, okay, so for me to capture that, I have to, you know, provide a better marketplace. I have to do these things, which is I have to make the trust and the comfort level X amount. I have to be aware of AI that's going to come, that's going to convince me I'm somebody I'm not, or whatever the case may be. The AI and the you know the things like that will be ahead of us as people. So you're going to have these things that are coming down the road that you have to be aware of, because if any of those come down and defeat what you're doing, then as a product, your your life cycle could be over at that point. Fair enough. Um, now, that's just for any generic thing. I'm just using those examples of how to understand what's going on. Um, if everybody says, oh, you have to adopt this standard, but you didn't because you didn't see it coming, then that could make you the odd the, the odd person out. So emerging tech and how the future is coming is really more important. That's where the vision comes into play. Clarity of that pathway and what has to be at the end. And then from here, you're just going to get a go and build your product you know you're going to be going to build your product whatever that turns out to be but in that process of doing this you're going to build the why you which isn't so much your fault your your culture or excuse me your vision but it is that little bit of building your culture and driving where you're headed and your business success you know the why you isn't about having a better product because we don't know if you have a better one yet it's too early but we do understand that we're all on the same page for where you see the future going, what you see the opportunity, how you believe you need to get there and where you fit in the sandbox. We're all on page that you understand that you get that. And we all we're all on agreement of that. Now, the why you is the squishy stuff. Do you have any patents? Is your, do you have a business model? Many things you're going to do will be about your business model, not the product you're building. You could be a next Uber or the next way to apply it. So the secret is going to be the people that apply AI smartly to their own business models. It's not just about talking to your computer. It's making the AI do important things. Maybe you've got a business that needs to be in certain locations and have certain types of demographics available in that certain location. McDonald's built their whole business by understanding neighborhoods. They knew that once a neighborhood within an X circle, got to X number of people, this demographic, then they knew they could build a McDonald's and that McDonald's would make money and sell at a profit. They just knew it would, and it did. Once they figured that out, they were good to go. So maybe now, instead of AI, that you can talk to your computer, you do a plug-in, so now it talks to your computer, but your AI does all the work that McDonald's had to do manually, which is to go out and scan just demographics around locations and villages that says, okay, these locations, these villages are the right ones. This is where we should roll out to next. This is how we should do that. So put your application and your AI in the right aspect and how to use it and how to use it in your business model. And of course, having the right people on your team that have Cousins and friends that know somebody who knows somebody is also a really good way to get started. Help you with your partnerships. It's about speed to market. And I believe that was about what we had for today. Oh. So right now we're going to go into, you said a minute, hour and 20. So that was about hour 20. So now we can do Q&A. We can play with some more vision statements, whatever, uh, seems the next thing to do okay uh before we go uh, i want to thank you so much gary for making out the time to 
hold this workshop for us. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so now I'm going to make the floor open. Anyone you want to uh, share your visual statement for Mr. Gary to make some input or you want to ask a question based on everything he has said or just whatever it is you... So I'll... Yeah, I think I have the first person, uh, Victor G. Brain. Go ahead. All right, Victor, go ahead. All right, thank you so much, uh, Gary. Um, this is this workshop has, has been very, very insightful for me personally. I've learned a lot, I've seen my videos from different perspectives and a better perspective for the matter. So, please, you're a little please, bit uh, quiet. Oh, wow, yeah. Is it better now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, first, I appreciate um, the, um, the the lecture given to us. It's quite very insightful for me, and I've learned a lot. So um, I just want to um, read out my vision so you could um, shed more light on it for me. Sure. Let's see. Okay, so my company name is Artisan Oga. So we connect... Um, skill workers to jobs. So our vision statement is, uh, we believe in a future where, where uh, sorry, we believe in a future, future of work where works are, are skill-based and rather than certificates. Uh, sorry, I'll take that again. Uh, we believe in a future where jobs are skill-based and not necessarily certificates. Skill-based, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. let's use that as a simple as a simple uh, perspective. So we'll kind of go through the process we just went through a little bit here from there. So the skill based, I think that's a great idea. That's and so forth. Um, the opportunity there obviously is large. There's going to be a lot of hirings, a lot of people, a lot of jobs created, a lot of stuff going on. So the marketplace will be fine. So now, what are the what's the strategic problems you need to solve in your vision? To, to actually to do that, to ensure that they're skill-based, they're either tested or certified, or the various aspects of, of you know, the right skill, right place, and all the complexities of that. Does that make sense? Okay, yes, yeah, sure. So um, the program we identified was, um, uh, it was just when I was fresh out of the university and I was so proud of my certificates. I got there with, uh, with, uh, what we call in Nigeria, we call it two one. That's next to first class. So I was very, very proud of my certificate, and I knew um, I just had to just, you know, um, show the world my certificate, and the job will be there waiting for me. So that was my thinking when I was coming out of the university. But when the reality struck, I got to the uh, job market, and I found out that what employers were ask were asking me was, "What can you do?" Everywhere I, I went for job or interview, the first question they asked is, what can you do? So I was right. a little embarrassed. I immediately realized that my certificate was just 10% uh, of what I needed to succeed in life. Okay, so let's put that in perspective. It's no difference than going, you know, when they, you know, your parents say, oh, you got to go to college, go to college, you get done, You everybody will want to hire you. And so these things don't necessarily define skill. Where you've been, and so forth may identify things but not skills. So I think you're on the right track. The idea of you know will be skills based, I think is is a is is the right way to do it. And so now there's a couple things that you can look at in the world as you're developing your vision. One would argue that they've always been skills based. You're hired because of your skills. Now, we realize that that's not always the case for a variety of things, whether it's economic, political, whatever. There's all sorts of reasons why people get hired. So now, if we're looking at a skills-based and just assume that, that that's a right way to do something, what else in the future um, goes along with a skills-based work? Again, you can't just connect. So now, what would the action come out of that? So does, does that make sense? I'm just kind of digging a little deeper in where it goes from just being skills. That's a, that's a nice, easy, simple one, but I think we could add more depth to that vision. 
Victor, you understand what he's saying? Uh, yes, I understand. So, uh, okay. so uh, I, I would like to know the depth. Um, if the vision is fantastic, okay, fine. Then I'm moving forward. So, what next? Step, what's um, what are the next steps I need to take to um, to make the vision actually? Um, practical? Yeah. So let me let me do this. I always think things something along the lines of, you know, it has to be skills based. But it may also have to be transferable. Okay. Because people don't work for the same job for 25 years anymore. That's so true. I got hired at a job because of my skills for that job. But then did I get more skills or whatever? But now I'm leaving to go to another job and I've got to do this again. So skills base is, is good. But transferable is not. When you work someplace, people know you and they say, oh, Victor, I know Victor. Victor's good. He, you know, he does, he's a good job. But now I leave and go somewhere else. Well, who's Victor? I don't know. Is he any good? I don't know. Victor says he's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so now think about your vision in a more of a visionary, not just that it's skills based, but what is technology? Where is the pathway going? For, for it are people going to be hired the same way are do, maybe interviews don't even happen i just go through and say i look i do i come out i find you your skills match what i'm looking for i hit a button that button sends a test to me i look at that and say oh this company wants to hire me i take their test i draw something i show that i know how to do something it comes back and the guy says okay you're hired be here you know, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And so that could be a whole new method of which hiring happens. So think about it more, more futuristic, not just how do I do it today with a piece of paper or LinkedIn or something like that. That's where I was going for a little more depth. Okay. Okay, so, so, so what, what we're doing uh, is uh, we're just building, we're building a marketplace where People's uh, job seeker skills are more um, highlighted, and I uh, will put the skills of the job seekers on the sh on the shelf, so employers can easily identify those skills and make connections with them and hire them. So, well, maybe, um, but again, think about what's out there, like we've talked about in the com competition. What's been out there forever? Oh, I've got friends that say, "Hey, this person's really good. Hire them." Um, I've got LinkedIn. That could be a, they're almost the old school, but they're kind of new kids. They put it online and made it available, what's been available for a long time. So there's a variety of tools out there that I can do right now to line up. Um, I don't know about Africa, but I suspect there's some, you know, it used to be done through the farming communities. You know, everybody knew somebody who knew somebody and they just said, hey, I'm looking for something at the farmer's market. And then that somebody would show up. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how that's how it works in Africa, but a lot of times in farming communities and various things like that, that's where a lot of things have, or the people just show up with their crafts or whatever it is they do. Um, so I think you want to be more futuristic looking of where is it going? What's happening? What's it going to look like? It's going to, it's going to have some sort of, you know, things going on AI. It'll be on a phone and there's demographics. So just think a little bit more. I do like the eye of it being skills based. That's a very simple aspect of it. And I think that's great. So think about that a little bit more of, of what that means at the end product that would be sold. Marketplace is, is fine, but you want to be careful because if not, in the next two years, there'll be a lot of marketplaces coming that you're not aware of today because they're they're startups and they're going to be more modern than what's out there today that's true um yeah thank you so much Gary. sure sure and this is really a, an important part here because these are the timing of things once you start writing code start bending metal start putting things into place um then things get more complicated and more costly so it's important to make sure that you're, you know, headed the right way. Now, if you're not necessarily looking for private funding and things like that, then you could just create a nice small business for yourself. Um, but 
if you're going to come down this road, you want to make sure you put something together that can take advantage of the next coming of, of technology so that, you know, it doesn't have to be a unicorn. But if you build a good quality SaaS company, you should be able to operate 80% profit margin. And if you can make 25 or $50 million a year, put $40 million in the bank, then that's good. So, all right, well, that's that's good job. I like that, where you were headed there on that vision. I would just think that and see if there's a little more insight. Because my example for the future of the automobile will be electric. That's kind of a real simple one that falls in that same category. Um, but there's more things now. You may be the future of the automobile will be electric and self-driving. And if that's the case, then that changes the market space I'm out in, and that changes the market direction I'm going and the things I'm focusing on. Maybe. All right. So, all right. Anyone else want to try? How are we doing on time? Okay, let's, good. Let, let's take one more person. Uh, okay, Chigazi, yeah. Okay, let me, sorry, let me, sorry, Chigazi, let me take Marvelous. Sorry about that. I, I know you've said something in the past. Let me just take Marvelous. Yeah, I know you've not spoken today. Yeah. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh... Good evening, everybody. And also thank uh, Mr. Gary. So, like, that's very impactful. So, um, I have want to go through, or from what you said, I just want to um, read out what I've been able to take down and also how, I, uh, how I've been able to infuse it in my uh, startup that I'm building. So, I'm just going to tell you briefly, uh, based on all what you taught us, I'm going to use that explanation to describe my startup to you. So, um, so you tell me there, uh, or possibly what is not in order and what is in order. Sure. You're, you're a little bit of a, not really an echo, but there's a little bit of a, of a digital voice thing going on. So I, I may have to have you repeat a couple of times just in case. So, oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, um, the after the building, uh, an event management uh, system is an echo friendly, paperless, social event management system. Uh, it's called Eritnet. And we actually uh, envision a world where event planning is going to be completely effortless, paperless, seamless, and um, socially impactful. This is the primary... You're kind of aspect. breaking up on my end. I'm having a hard time getting all the words together. Let me let me turn off my camera. See if that helps. Mar Marvelous. Even from my end, I think your voice is kind of. Uh, could could you be from your microphone or could you? I don't know. All right. Is it is it okay? Is yeah. it okay now? Oh, that's better. Much better. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, like I said, um, we are actually working on an events management system an eco-friendly, paperless social events management system. And our vision in Eric Next is to create a world where events planning is completely effortless, paperless, seamless, and socially impactful. And what, what we do is to actually enable event organizers to generate revenue um, planning for their events and also hall owners to rent, to lease and rent their halls using a system. So we do this by providing a mobile and web application that enables these users, um, these event planners to, to upload their events and also list their halls for, for event attendees or, or event organizers. Now, okay, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about some of the specifics in your vision. Right, so okay. you, you talk about, so I see, so the future of event planning will be seamless and uh, what was that? Uh, so, and have social impact, right? Yeah, yeah, social impact. Okay, okay. So I'm I'm good with that. And now you can, I, I can easily, go ahead. Hello? 
Yeah. Hello? Yeah, go me? ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, you're good. We're good. You're good. Okay. I, I made a uh, use of this word, paperless, simplex, effortless, and socially impactful. Yeah, but that's too many words. You don't need all those words. If it's just seamless and has a social impact, that, that could be good enough. You don't want to have I all... I you. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, so I think that's good there. So now... So, so I can... I, I can see the impact on that because one of the problems, particularly large events, is not only social but environment. Um, quite often, the mess that's created by large events has an impact yeah. on the, the re environment. It's socially unacceptable. People come, they have an event, they leave, and now there's a mess. Um, so, but that's just one example. So, I can easily see this vision coming into an opportunity. And being into the event management and environment, social impact of that and how to make them, you know, how to have better events that even the neighbors around you like. Fair enough? Exactly. So that, that, yes. So that, that, that's, the, that's the vision we are actually trying to, uh, the, 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 some of the problems we've been able to identify that we are try, uh, or tackling whereby we're making sure that um, uh, our own experience uh, fosters a sustainability. You get so the focal point is sustainability. That, that, that's okay, a, fair that, enough. That's fair uh, enough. Hello? No, you're good. I, we can hear you. I'm just saying that, you know, that's good. I think sustainability is a good part of it. I don't think that's thought of enough in it. So I think from the problems is fine. So back to your your statement that the future of event planning will be seamless. Yeah. And then from there, however you want to bring in the word socially, social impact, and we'll deliver a social impact. Okay. Um, so I think that's good. I think that's a good start on a on a on a vision statement. Okay. And then right. the rest of it will be identifying that appointment. What does that really mean? What, is, what are the real opportunities within making event planning seamless and having a social impact? Where is the money to be made in there? And that's where the opportunity comes through and the market segments and so forth. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, yeah, I think we will have to call it a day today. It's been a very informative and uh, thought-provoking. Yeah, so guys, you can see that we are in for a very long, interesting journey. By the time we are done, you are going to have a lot of... Uh, you're going to come out better, uh, you know. A, a, a lot of people just think that to build a startup is just you come up with something, write some code, build a product, and then start looking for funding. There's so many things that has to go into place. You have to be ready. You have to convince people that you know what you're doing and uh, uh, before you begin to even look at money. So that's why we started this uh, with understanding and crafting your business vision. And I think Gary has done uh, a wonderful work. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. Uh, no problem. It's a yeah. lot of area. It's a complicated, it, it doesn't happen instantly, but hopefully <clears throat> you can have access to recordings or whatever, and you can work on these over the next week. And because this is a real critical part to make yes. sure that you're not one of the nine out of 10 startups that fail. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Um, please, uh, we'll continue on our, our Telegram channel. I will, uh, we have been going through some of this. So, some of you may need to go back on the vision statement you submitted already. You may need to go work on it. This is, this is a, this is a, this has been enlightening. Uh, even though uh, we have already uh, accepted some of them, but you can just go back and look at what you've done. If you want to resubmit, that's okay. And then, uh, so I think we have had a very, uh, 
yeah the recording will also be made available that's why you're in the program so you can also throughout this week you can have 